All right. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Savannah Wood. I'm a Baltimore City Historical Society board member, and um, I'm on the Baltimore History Evenings Committee, along with Mike Franch and David Armenti. And Allison Seiler is our um, honorary committee member because she's been holding down these Zoom calls since the pandemic started. So thank you for that. Um, Baltimore History Evenings take place once a month from January to June, typically on the third Thursday at seven. Um, historically speaking, they have been at the Village Learning Place, but since the pandemic, we've been doing it on Zoom, which has been kind of nice because then we're able to bring people in from other places as well to talk about Baltimore history. Um, so as you're getting settled in, please just make sure that your microphones are muted. And I wanted to let you know that this program will run about an hour long, including time for questions and answers. So if you have questions during Dr. Frecchia's presentation, you can write them in the chat and we'll keep an eye out for that. Or if you'd prefer, you can write your question down and wait until the end and unmute yourself then to ask your question yourself. It's really up to you. But um, tonight's program and this entire 2022 season has been sponsored by Trace Architects and Arcadia Publishing. So thanks to both of them for helping us make this happen. And tonight we're gonna hear from Do Dr. Adam Frackia about overlooked places telling the interconnected history of Maryland through recent archeology span in Baltimore. Dr. Frackia is an archeologist and assistant research professor at the University of Maryland. And he has led several archeological excavations in and around Baltimore, including several recent excavations in West Baltimore. In this talk, he'll share some of that research and those findings. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Frackia. Thanks everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Savannah. Now, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, everybody can see the slide? Yes. Great, okay. So I'm gonna talk, uh, I probably have way too many slides here, but I'm gonna talk about some of the research uh, and the interconnectedness of uh, several places inside of Baltimore City proper and just outside of the city. And kind of show you some of the work I've been doing, but also some of the neglected history uh, of, of Baltimore and, and Baltimore County, but it all, it all comes together. Um, through, through Baltimore City. My larger research goals is to document the archeological heritage of Baltimore, uh, especially uh, lately West Baltimore and sites that are under threat, um, either by development or, or looting or even just neglect. And part of this is a larger effort to build awareness, allow people to use these sites and also foster preservation. So if we know about it, we know what's there, we can better preserve it. Uh, my overall research, tends to look at the, the history of the working class in Baltimore and labor. So the archeology span of work uh, more simply. And through that, looking at local, regional and national networks and how Baltimore is part of uh, essentially an international global economy and how has that functioned? How has that affected people in Baltimore, people in Minnesota, people across the globe? Right? And I do that as an archeologist by exploring spatial and material expressions of, of different identities of race, class, ethnicity, and gender, and how they're interconnected, that, inter, that um, intersect on, at intersectionality um, and how that plays out. And being able to look at these sites, understand the site and be able to compare the sites um, and really kind of tell the history of these different sites and more or less the people of, of these sites. Okay, I kind of start off with this and this is kind of geared the research um, so this is from one of the day books, which is in the uh, Maryland Historical Society from the Charles Ridgely, who operated the Northampton Furnace. And so between 1775 and 1777, under profit and loss, he lists five servants at his forge who died from exertion. Right? And the fact that it's listed under profit and loss kind of tells you how he valued his workers. So you can see that beautiful building below the Hampton Mansion, which you can go tour, which is a National Historical Site now. But if you realize the profit, he's generating the profit to create this home, which was one of the biggest homes when it was constructed in, the, I believe, in the 1780s or 1790s. And so this, this house is, this gilded house is essentially made from overworking people to essentially to death um, in, his, in his iron forge. 
And it kind of speaks to a larger conception of Baltimore. I mean, we realize Baltimore has both affluence and poverty. Right? And why, is, why do we have this, this larger dichotomy? And as a researcher, why haven't we focused on the archaeology of, of Baltimore, sections of Baltimore, essentially the wings of the black butterfly? Why haven't we prioritized uh, those areas when there's, a, when there's a story to tell there? And also speak to why there are two cities. Okay. So going back to the furnace, you know, thinking about nature of value and how people are valued, uh, we decided to run a research project um, in Baltimore County, just north of the city, uh, just north of Towson. And the Northampton Furnace, you can see, it was positioned because it was near iron ore, or this band of iron ore that runs from DC, essentially up the fall line. And at, during this period, in the colonial period, uh, what happens is uh, the, there's a war, Sweden loses its, its ability to supply England with iron. So England looks to the colonies to supply their iron. And it becomes a very lucrative trade, especially in Maryland, these iron forges. What does Maryland have? Uh, like many of these other colonies, it has iron, it has a um, supply of wood to make charcoal, and it has a supply of people, of labor. And so all of those come together to, to allow these very profitable operations that make people like the Ridgely's extremely wealthy. Now, I can't, I, since this is being recorded, I can't actually show you the location of the site since it's have problems with it actively being looted. Um, but basically the site now is on the Lock Raven Reservoir. So you're essentially looking up from Towson and you can see the scattering of not just iron mines, but also limestone quarries. And so you need limestone and iron for the production of iron ore for the production of iron. And you can actually see a whole nother site. If you look to the left of this map, you can see my cursor. This is the Texas quarry where they mine the um, uh, limestone for the Washington Monument. They actually brought in Irish laborers to do that. So there's a whole history of labor uh, connected with, you know, the marble steps in Baltimore, sending iron to Baltimore. This is a, net, a larger network. So this is kind of what we did one summer. We brought out students from the University of Delaware. And this is kind of the landscape we, we were looking for. We were not trying to understand the nature of the iron operations, but trying to recover um, artifacts and understand the nature of the people who work there. So what the Ridgelys did was they, they, hired, or they hired some free labor, but mainly convicts and indentured servants. They didn't use very many enslaved people initially. Why? Because if they lost an enslaved person, they lost an investment. Remember, if you remember that profit and loss. And it wasn't until after the revolution when the indentured servant system breaks down that they start using enslaved labor. It allows them to accumulate massive sources of wealth. Um, by the end of... Um, by the end of the revolution, I believe they have about 24,000 acres of land. They're a very large landowner, one of the largest slave owners, they actually target loyalist um, iron operations so that after the war, they're able to seize those operations, iron operations and the enslaved individuals working there. So they had skilled enslaved labor. So one of the things in this landscape, going back, you can kind of see how it looks like a jungle. You literally can't see where you're walking. Uh, so one of the things we did was try and figure out where this this iron operation was. Uh, this is an 1843 map of the property. And I'm gonna zoom in here. You can kind of see from this, you can see old furnace marked at the bottom. You see old coal house dwelling. So these were our keys to trying to figure out where this original operation, where could we find where the enslaved people, the convict laborer, the indentured servants were living who ran this iron operation. This iron operation supplied cannon, to the revolution and made everyday items like kettles. So it was a massive iron operation. So I, I've taken out a couple of slides. So this kind of jumps around uh, because I didn't want to show the location of this, but basically this is what we call LIDAR, which is light detection and imaging. And it basically allows us to see minute changes in the ground. And I know this is kind of fuzzy, but these are, you can see features that pop out from the ground um, just by the changes in elevation, which is pretty amazing. So we have a bank barn, earlier bank barn, foundations and wells, part of the coal house. And what this allows us to do is to take that map and geo-reference it on the actual current uh, landscape. So we, we actually point our excavations. Also, this is another a LIDAR image, but we can actually see some of this larger industrial landscape um, that, that it kind of shaped not just uh, Baltimore City, uh, Baltimore County, but also Baltimore City. So you see quarries, bar pits, a dam. And this is kind of what the dam looks like today if you were to walk along the reservoir. You can see 
this large earthen dam that was used to hold water to drive the wheel that would supply air to the, the furnace. These fall remnants of the later furnace farm, a tenant farm that was in operation after the furnace was uh, discontinued in the 1820s. So the furnace ran from 1760s to 1820s. And this is kind of what the furnace looks like now. It's actually underwater in the, in the um, Lock Raven Reservoir. There's the, the what remains of the furnace stack. And to the right, you can cut and see what we call the bridge house where they could actually walk across to the top and feed it with iron ore and, and fuel. We found some outbuilding foundations. This is kind of, uh, just to give you an idea, this is our, our testing strategy. So you can see, it kind of looks pretty, but you can see all of these uh, little test units. Um, so we're, we're trying to target certain areas to try and recover uh, distant domestic material. So we can tell the story of these furnace workers. And then these, all these little green circles are kind of little pits that we dug stratigraphically. So each soil lever gets marked and recorded. And so students from the University of Delaware were trained in how to do archeological methodology while we were doing this. And what did we recover? We actually found part of a cellar, uh, probably for the um, uh, Oak Furnace Manager's house and, and portions of the actual building wall on the left here. Okay, why is this story important? Well, it tells us obviously the history of the enslaved convict and indentured servants, many of the people we don't even know their names or maybe just the first name. So we can begin to flush out um, the history of the furnace and the furnace workers. This, it, it's, it's all part of a larger story. You know, this is the stuff that made Baltimore. This is what fueled the beginning of Baltimore. This stuff was shipped and from Northampton, was shipped out of the port, shipped as ballast directly to England. It grew profit, it built, it helped build Baltimore. So we're gonna to transition to another site where we're actively working on, which is the colonial port town of Joppa. And oddly enough, Joppa is, is located on the gunpowder. It's actually located, if you see Northampton here, uh, the gunpowder flows to right by Joppa here. Why is that important? Because actually, the clear cutting of land, the, the, the um, cutting of land for tobacco, cutting of land to make charcoal actually silted in the gunpowder and actually doomed this, this, this colonial port town. It silted in and they weren't actually able to access the water anymore. This is an image of, of Joppa town, one of the plats. This is the area we, we wanted to focus on. So this town began in right around the beginning of the 18th century. By 1712, it was the um, uh, county seat for Baltimore County and it occupied that to 1768 when Baltimore, Baltimore Town uh, took over and became the county seat for Baltimore County. Um, so we were able to come and test part of this location and you can see it in the, this area marked in red. And our goal was to try and understand the nature of the layout of this town, what remained from this town, so we could begin to understand what life like was like in this town. And why is this town important? Well, it tells us a little bit about the early history of Baltimore, about the beginnings of labor, beginnings of uh, racial relations, of, of, of different relations. Even if you think about this, this is right on the eve of the revolution too. Ideas about uh, the country, about uh, taxation, about um, um, colonial rule. All of this is being you know, negotiated within the taverns, within the courthouse, within this, uh, this mixing of, of, of the, at this port. So this is kind of what, what happened to this town. So we, we have, if I go back here, we have about 40 lots that were laid out with a parish church, courthouse, prison, uh, warehouses, um, taverns, inns. So a, a, a town, a fairly small town by any standards. But um, after the town, after the siltation, after it loses the county seat, it kind of fades from existence. Um, and it kind of reverts back to agriculture until the 1960s and its proximity to Baltimore kind of brings it back to life and it becomes a suburban, essentially a suburban waterfront community and is developed uh, as such. And they, build, they dig all of these large trenches and so people can have essentially water access from their homes. And you can see, this is kind of the core area I was showing you in this bottom right picture and just some of the tenant farms that are scattered in what was once the center of this colonial port town. Some of the work we've done is, this is that core area again, is trying to do geophysical work so we can identify features below the surface. And this, you can see the development here, the Rumsey Island development. And you can see what remains of what was actually where they could dock ships directly into Joppa town, the port, 
and how much siltation. And that's all, that's from clear cutting for, for the furnace. This is clear cutting for tobacco agriculture and how essentially their economy ruined, ruined the port. This is just a picture of us doing geophysical work with the Maryland Historical Trust. We hope to actually do some more detailed work. And this is kind of what geophysical work uh, GPR, what ground penetrating radar provides. And you can see the, we knew where the church was, but this kind of confirms the 1720s church foundation, some utility lines and some road traces, some of the debris from the tenant farm. And this allows us to kind of figure out what's below the surface before you even excavate. And just to give you an example, this is from 2021 in the summer. Uh, we actually found located one of the structures. This is the courthouse. It's about 1.9 meters below the surface, but the very remains of the, the inside of the courthouse. And you can see the brick floor and you can see a wall. So this is just the beginnings of this project to kind of begin to understand Joppa Town, its layout and the people who live there. You can see in this picture, all of these layers of stratigraphic fill, probably from the late uh, 18th to early uh, 19th century. All right, so we're going to pivot. I'm going to pivot back to Baltimore now. Let's see. So one of the one of the things that concerned me about um, essentially areas within the Black Butterfly in terms of West Baltimore and East Baltimore was just the large large scale demolition. And I know vacants are a problem, but just the large scale demolition of, of whole blocks without the recovery of of art of archaeology or even just historical documentation. All right, and when you read Governor Hogan's statement here. You know, it really sees these as, uh, you know, that idea of urban renewal, the contagion of these as, 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 as locus of, of, of disease or, you know, something that has to be torn down. Otherwise, it's going to, it's going to infect other things instead of really addressing what the larger problem with, with why these buildings are vacant. And I know they are hazardous, uh, but why, why are we, why are we taking these whole without recording the information? without documenting the history of these properties. So I was just gonna give you an overview of some of the projects I've participated on or led uh, within West Baltimore and Lemon Street a little bit South. Um, so Edding Street, Upton, the Upton Mansion, the Sellers Mansion, work in Lafayette Square, and of course, Lemon Street. So Lafayette Square was a, um, actually an Archaeological Society of Maryland's kind of weekend dig. Uh, volunteers through David Gatsby now works for the Park Service. But it was really just to see what was, what from the um, from the um, what material record existed in the park, and they focused on the Civil War history when Lafayette Square was being developed. Uh, the Civil War occurred, and they actually used the park as a, a Union uh, campground. And, and um, uh, for the I think it was Maryland and Delaware infantry, uh, but a series of excavations actually found located some structures and material from. The Civil War occupation of that property. Right across the street, we have the Sellers Mansion. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Sellers Mansion. A big honking edifice, very big building. Um, looks gorgeous in its prime, but the Sellers Mansion um, essentially has gone through several attempted renovations. Uh, the latest one seems to have stalled, but unfortunately, the so Chap um, asked us to come in and investigate uh, before the um, the reno they did renovations on the, the um, yard area of this property. Um, this is kind of what it looked like in 2018. It looks, I would say it looks worse now, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the pictures inside are even worse. It's really depressing. But um, so we thought you know, this is a great idea. This is, this is, this is a beautiful building. Um, it kind of anchors that corner. And let's, let's see what we can see archeologically. Um, the history of the Sellers. Uh, so Matthew Sellers comes up from Louisiana. He's uh, essentially is a, owns a plantation in Louisiana. He comes up, he lives in Philadelphia for a little while, then settles in Baltimore. He builds this massive mansion. He becomes president of the North Central Railroad. Um, he builds this mansion because it's on a hill, on the side of a hill. It's a prominent location. It's in a, a Victorian square. It's the place to be. He shows his, his opulence, his power with this, with this large gaudy mansion. Okay, and this is what it looked like in 1869 bird's eye view. You can see there's actually a carriage house attached. Kind of what it looked like right on the outskirts of what was Baltimore at that time, development in Baltimore. 
One of the interesting things with Matthew Sellers is he went and he took his family on a, a trip to Europe, one of the classical trips you know, for several months for a while, as, as I guess people did in that time period who, had, who could. And um, when he came back, he found out the lot that was north of his, right adjacent to his, uh, which he didn't own. Somebody had actually built a row house and he got really pissed off. He was very angry about this. Um, and so what he did, um, rather than talk to his neighbors, built a 40 foot high spite wall. And not only a spite wall, but he built this nursery building attached to it, this kind of ornate nursery building, right? So he was very concerned with managing space and controlling space in this, in his neighborhood. So we brought a team of volunteers together um, and excavated. You can see how tiny the yard space is. And this is along the North Yard and then the East Yard. And we were only supposed to dig a unit there, but when you looked at the footprint of the renovations, it was gonna tear up most of the yard. So we took this, this opportunity to explore this yard in depth. And what did we find? We found lots of demolition debris. We found brick walkways, lots of different artifacts. Uh, we actually located the nursery building, this bow front portion of the nursery building. Why was this important? Because we know the history of the sellers. It's fairly well documented. Uh, there, some of the members of the family are famous or, but we didn't know the, we know the names of the people who work for the sellers, uh, but we didn't know that much more about them. So we thought this three-story building was probably a location that actually we're living in. So we could recover some of the material culture of the people working for the sellers as domestics. Uh, and we did, we found, we found uh, material that probably was associated with the seller's family, as well as um, with uh, the people working for the sellers. So you see some of the ceramics, some of the kids' toys, some ginger beer bottles, a bone button, a porcelain button, some doll parts, some prescription, local prescription bottles. So that was, I mean, that was what we expected to find. One of the really cool things about this project is we're talking to the neighborhood about the, about the, about the building. And many of the people didn't know anything about the sellers, but they remembered this was their building. This is the building they, they, they sat on to watch parades or, or they had picnics in the backyard. So the, that association, uh, but also this building was used after the cell, last of the seller's uh, children, I think it was in the 1950s, um, uh, passed away, the building was sold. And it had many different uh, uses from a community center to a center, uh, to a project champ location, um, to being used uh, by the St. James Church. And we found some evidence of, of, that, of, of that use. Uh, so, you know, a paddle ball, um, previous renovation, uh, essentially a uh, cupcake stopper, a battleship peg. And if you know about battleship, it's a red peg. So it's a hit, which is pretty cool. A decorative pebble. So, you know, the, from a planter, part of a chair leg, fish hook. So it shows that people, you know, this is, this wasn't the massive structure was a, a very important part of the community and being used by the, the community, not just this, the history of the sellers, which kind of was the focus of the, of the preservation work or what we were trying to recover archeologically. But obviously the history post 1950s is super important as well. And, and it also speaks to kind of the conditions of the neighborhood. You know, we had to dig through essentially what we call the needle layer in Baltimore. You know, that first layer where you can't take off your gloves and you really shouldn't be using your hands in the, in the layer because the, just the amount of drug paraphernalia or other things that could potentially harm you. But then, you know, it speaks to the conditions of the neighborhood and, and what the neighborhood's being subjected to in terms of disinvestment uh, over the last, you know, since it really, 19, since the 1950s. And this is just to kind of orient you to take us to our next location. Um, this is kind of where the seller's mansion would have been on this 1801 property uh, um, on this map, the Warner and Hannah map. Uh, but if we move to the right in this area in the blue, this is the Ireland estate, which Ireland was a merchant from Barbados who came to Baltimore and established a property here, uh, a large estate. Um, but before you get there, I just wanted to mention, you know, being able to, to compare these many sites is really, really important um, because we can, you know, we can understand what for Lemon Street, 912 and 914 were alley houses that were occupied by primarily German and Irish immigrants through uh, most of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, we recovered some material from the backyards. We were fortunate to, to excavate there. But, you know, 912 and 914 Lemon Street were, were um, 
um, were supposed to be demolished. And it was only through the fight of several members uh, who established the Irish Shrine to the railroad worker that these buildings were actually preserved and are now a museum. But we you know this is kind of the material. This is some of the material that recovered from the backyard that tells us the history of the, um, the two families, the two large families that lived in these, in these properties. And this material is not that much different than what you'd find in an other working class uh, uh, assemblages. All right, so one of the things we wanted to really focus on after the Sellers Mansion project and after doing the work at the furnace was really telling, trying to record some of the archaeological history of West Baltimore. And you know, the, the heritage of West Baltimore is, 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 is fairly amazing. And thinking about the segregation policies that developed in the early 20th century, the formalized segregation and informalized segregation policies that essentially began to confine um, uh, Black individuals to essentially West and East Baltimore, but primarily West Baltimore, but also what happened with that and the, the fluorescence of, of, uh, of culture, of social organizations, especially through the church. And you know, the, this is the, these are the neighborhoods where we get Thurgood Marshall growing up, where we get um, you know, Cab Calloway, we get these, these major figures, uh, Perrin Mitchell, we have all these figures living in this neighborhood. So telling some of that archaeological history and trying to, to recover what might be lost is, was one of our goals. Um, so we, we were able to partner with Black Women Build, if you know anything about them and their, and their amazing work. And so they go and renovate um, homes that these homes on Edding Street, which you're looking at, were supposed to be demolished, but they bought them, they've renovated, they provide training to Black women and also affordable home ownership to them as well. Um, so thought this was a great program. We said we asked Shelly Hallstead, who's who's looking on in this picture to the left, can we come and test and want to test uh, some of these backyards before you you uh, dig them up and renovate them? And she she was nice enough to agree. Um, and so oops, going the wrong way. So we we began testing in 1905 Edding Street, and this is what 1905 Edding Street looked like uh, in the 19 teens 20s. This is kind of what it looked like in 1869, this bottom picture. So it was kind of on the limits, once again, of, of the city. Um, and this is kind of what it looked like when I visited it in winter of 2020. Um, so not much going on. Uh, they were just beginning to renovate it. Hopefully you can cite, this is what it looked like. It kind of looks like what the seller's mansion looks like inside right now, unfortunately. This is what they have to work with. You know, they basically clear it out. They stabilize it and then they try and rebuild it. And this is kind of what the backyard looked like, this little postage stamp. And believe it or not, this is where we tested and this is where we looked for the remains, uh, the material culture of the people who lived in this building. But you can see she's already, she's already fixed the inside and closed it in. It's, it's beautiful work she does. And so one of our goals was, you know what, we're gonna bring students in, but we're gonna try and bring as many students who wanna come from any university that want they want to, but we're also going to try and prioritize students from uh, within Baltimore. And so we were able to get some money from Preservation Maryland to offer uh, some grant money to for students to participate on this project. So we have students from the University of Maryland, Morgan State, University of Delaware, uh, Coppin State, and Gout a colleague from Goucher College, as well as colleagues from Coppin State, Morgan State, University of Baltimore, uh, and everything seemingly in between. All right. We even had the police come visit because I guess we looked a little odd. Um, but one of the cool things about this project was just the, the amount of people who wanted to be involved to learn archaeology, participate. Um, and so, you know, I had people we were working on a project um, in Lincoln Park. Um, uh, and uh, we had a, a woman who was interested in who does historic research. So she was actually able to come in and she did the historic research. And the woman who lived in 1905 Edding Street it's from 1900 to 1940 was Sarah McGill. And she traced this woman's life, which was, I wouldn't be able to do this level of historical research. We were able to figure out she had three children. None of them survived uh, by, I believe it was 1910, 1920. Uh, but we were able to figure out her whole family tree, where she was born. Uh, I thought this was very impressive. But what do we do? We test in the backyard to find evidence of uh, Sarah McGill's life. So she, Sarah McGill lived in this from 1900 to mid 1940s, and then it went through a series of renters until it was abandoned in the 2000s. But, so we tested in the backyard. We found, you can see essentially lots of sewer lines, sewer pipes, lots of utility lines. 
and we worked around those. And I know this is kind of fuzzy, but you can just see all of these water lines and gas lines, which were really fun to, to excavate around. But there's lots of material culture from um, the 1890s to the 1930s thrown into this mix. And right below, you can see there's a layer of coal ash. This is the excavations. This is kind of what some of those utility lines we were working around, but you can see at the bottom, there's just layers of coal ash, which probably would not have been a good environment to, to have. And it might've been a function of dumping to level this land out. You really wouldn't want to be using a backyard that was full of coal ash and clinker. This is some of the material we recovered in excavating 1905 Edding Street. So if you look in the light, you see chicken bones, uh, window glass, uh, copper alloy hook, and an oyster shell, as well as doll parts. So a nice mix of domestic mat material that would have been in the house. And why do we excavate in the backyard? Because that's usually where people throw their trash, especially in their privy. Since there's no, there's not, at this point in time, there's no garbage collection. So your, your privy is essentially your trash can. Unfortunately, on this property, we didn't find the privy, but based on all those lines crisscrossing, uh, through the backyard, they probably impacted the privy and some of that material got dumped. And that's what we're finding. We recovered from these different layers. Right? And this is some of that other material. What was really cool is now we have a window into Sarah McGill's life, right? So we know what, some of the things she ate, the different, uh, you know, beef, cow, chick, uh, uh, fowl, chicken, catfish. We have a record of, of her diet, which is was amazing. You know, this was a building that would have been destroyed, but all of this would lost. Now we have a picture of this, this woman who worked as a laundress, who took in borders and what her life was like. And what we found was some really amazing stuff, not just ceramics and um, bottles, but, you know, we found some treatments for nervousness and we found lots of writing implements. So we found um, at least two inkwells. We found some slate stylists. We found a piece of slate with actual practice writing on it, which was super cool, um, and, and as well as some ink bottles. And what does this point to? Just the priority of reading and writing in the in Sarah McGill's household, you know, and also the pressures that she faced if all three of her children uh, were deceased. Right? It it kind of cuts both ways. Um, we also had the fortune of, we asked Shelly if we could come back, Shelly Halstead, if we could excavate another property. So we excavated on the other side of the street and we found a shared privy. We actually found the privy. I contacted some local bottle hunters and they were kind enough to come out and uh, we actually screened all this. And what you're looking at is the shared privy between 1904 and 1906 Edding Street at the very bottom. So this was a layer that was um, about 10 feet down and it was uh, within about two feet of liquid. So it was, if you can imagine what that liquid smelled like and looked like, yeah, it was pretty gross. But what does that do as an archaeologist? It's a gold mine because the privy is where it's thrown out, but privies are, if you keep using a privy, you're going to fill it up. So in Baltimore, you had people come and night soil men, they come at night and they empty out your privy, but you know, they wouldn't clean it to the very bottom. So we actually have that bottom layer preserved. And this is material probably from the 1890s, that's, or, and maybe a little bit later, sitting in this water. And what did the water do? It kept it from deteriorating. So we actually got wood preserved. And you can see in this, this other image, you can see uh, clothespins. You can see part of a, a coin purse, bone, and lots of leather. So we actually found that they were cutting leather soles out, repairing shoes. Wonderful um, stuff, stuff that we're actually analyzing at here at UMBC. Um, actually, we're analyzing it today, some of this material. Uh, University of Delaware was very kind enough to take this material because um, let's see the time here. Um, because this material, since it's waterlogged, if you let it dry out, a lot of this stuff will fall apart. Um, so there actually had students from the University of Delaware practicing conservation methods on this material, which is wonderful because we couldn't afford to conserve this material and they get great practice. So we've actually gone through the first batch of materials been conserved, which is amazing. And they learn, they actually look through the microscope at the, how these shoe soles were stitched um, so we're getting lots of great data from this too. But this is a wonderful window into 1890s African-American working class life uh, that would have been destroyed, um, was slated to be destroyed. Um, and this is kind of where Savannah Wood comes in. Uh, based on this work, we were able to go and test actually at the Upton Mansion. And the Upton Mansion has, um, similar to the Sellers Mansion, but it has a really, really unique history. And you can kind of see what the property looks like today. It's completely surrounded, but it had been a large estate. 
Okay, and going back to the Edward Ireland the image I showed you before. This is what it looks like more or less today. It's, it's boarded, I don't know if it's changed at all. Hopefully, no, <laughs> it's been boarded up. Unfortunately, people haven't treated it well uh, more recently, but let me go through the history for you here. So starts out, Edward Ireland has an estate in the 1780s, 1790s, a Georgian, a Georgian mansion, a large estate. Um, and he actually buys us from Darby Lux. And Darby Lux actually owned the Northampton Furnace, part of the Northampton Furnace. So all of the, remember how all of these sites are connected. So he's generating a lot of wealth. He's owning a lot of land. Uh, this Edward buys this property from him, builds this, builds a estate. Um, David Stewart comes in and buys it from uh, the family of Edward Ireland. He tears the building down and builds what you see now. This. Um, uh, um, Greek Revival building, um, this or very large uh, ornate mansion. And this is what it looked like in 1869. You can see how the property's already begun to shrink and how the city is being built around it. And this is what it looked in the 1860s when um, David Stewart, who was a US Senator, he eventually, he passes away and his family sells the building to the Demand family who are actually German woolen merchants. And they, they have many, there was up to like 20 people living in this building at a time. So the family living in this property. And you can actually see member, if you look at this photo close enough, you can actually see members of the main family walking around, which is pretty amazing. So the, we have the large estate, a large uh, mansion, and we have an attached carriage house. Later on, the, the building transitions, it becomes um, a home to a, a prominent black musician. Uh, for a period of time in the 1920s. Um, and then it becomes um, the home to the WCAO radio station, one of the early radio stations. And they actually erect two large uh, um, aerial towers. And you, it's hard to see the other one, it's kind of blurred out, but there are two towers and there was a, a line string strung between them. So they're actually using this as their, their center of operations and broadcasting directly out of this, out of this building which is pretty amazing. And when we tested there, we actually found remains of the, the um, concrete tower, the North Tower, which is really amazing. All right, so then what happens after um, when WCAO uh, leaves this building, it actually gets bought by the Baltimore Institute of Musical Arts, which was a music school that was founded to serve uh, essentially black musicians or anybody who wanted to learn training because they were segregated, because of segregation, they couldn't attend the Peabody. And so this music school started, um, they, it gets um, a lot of uh, immigrants coming from Europe who have escaped the war, who help. And one of the Mendelssohn uh, family members actually is on the board. They start this music school uh, to train uh, classical musicians. Um, and it, it runs for um, several years until really the, the to desegregation and um, also the GI Bill. Um, and then after that period of time, the Upton Mansion becomes a city building, a city uh, school building, um, and has various uses up until roughly almost to the present. Um, so one of our goals was to, because this building is going to be renovated, it's going to be the home of Afro Charities, which is uh, owns Afro newspaper. Um, we had to test the yard area and the, for that renovation, all right, to see what was what was there. And this was actually a compliance compliance driven project. So this was required by the state. And so we tried to actually involve members of the community and local universities. And you can see, this is Alex Simonet who helped us at Edding Street and also as a Morgan State student. Uh, we have a University of Maryland student. We also have an Excelsior University student, uh, Tammy, uh, who is a recent retiree from the US Army. Um, this is the backyard of the Upton Mansion, uh, essentially, which was actually the, the front originally. But this is where the annex of the building is going to go. And so the, uh, this was a parking lot. They, they stripped the asphalt off. And since this is where the actual footprint of the building is going to be, the, rent of, um, the existing annex, we actually tested this area with what we call shovel test pits, those stratigraphic excavations. And we also put in several units. And this is actually, um, this is Tammy again. This is another student from the University of Maryland. And this is actually Quancy Henderson, who is, um, lives in one of, those build one of those buildings she helped renovate in Edding Street. So she actually was a member of our team as well. So we had a great crew out there. 
what did we recover? This kind of looks like stuff from the last, all these other ones, right? But some really amazing stuff. Uh, some Chinese export porcelain, lots of bone, oyster shell, uh, some very finely decorated porcelain, some possible pieces of Tiffany glass from the Tiffany windows that were in the building, um, some vinyl records. Vinyl could be, which would be cool. It could be from um, musicians. It could be from the radio station. It could be from the music school, which would be really cool if we could find a way to read this. Um, and some other materials, this ornate uh, hat pin. But we found materials from every single period of time, occupation of this, of this building from um, Edward Ireland's original building to uh, the Demand family through, um, through, the, through to this, the use of the building by the school. So I'm gonna end with this one, but this was just, it shows you just the depth of, of, of history within, this, within these different segments, um, how these, these sites interact, but just also, you know, these, this is a history of all these different families or the history of Edding Street, all of these different items that are preserved and we can use these to kind of tell the stories of all these different locations. And, you know, how this building transitioned and the opportunities that this building provided is pretty amazing in terms of you know, servicing the community. And now the future history of this building service, serving this committee through, uh, serving the community through the opportunities is pretty amazing too. So I'm gonna stop, there's so many people to thank so all of these projects are collaborations with many different universities, many different partners, many different institutions. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to continue this work into the future and, and kind of tell a, a, a larger history uh, of Baltimore, a more inclusive history of Baltimore. So thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. That was super interesting for me. Um, if there are any questions, you can unmute yourself to ask, or if you want to put something in the chat, you could do that too. Um, I I had a question earlier, and Heather answered it. I was wondering if spite wall was a technical term. It shows up in the um, in the Sanborn insurance maps. It actually is listed as spite wall, so I guess it's a formal term. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? <laughs> what happens to all of these? Oh, sorry, Allison, go ahead. Thanks, Savannah. Um, I was sort of wondering about the archeology span programs for students and sort of the connections, um, I guess that you have made, um, you know, I think one of the things that, especially um, in uh, the marketplace article that was mentioned is that like, this isn't necessarily what some students wanna do career wise. Um, but I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about like how you use this as a tool to teach them other skills and things that they might use in their careers if they don't choose to pursue archeology. span um, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about how you mentor the students and, I was really also curious about how you made the connection with Morgan and which, you know, departments or people you worked with there um, to to get students to come because I know, like, for us at Johns Hopkins, one of the things that we'd like to do is get students potentially interested in like library science and archives and those sorts of things, uh, but we're not quite sure who to work with. Um, and so I just wonder if you could talk about that collaboration as well. Um. Sure. So one of my goals is since my, my degree is in anthropology and my focus is historic archaeology. One of my goals, I teach a lot of people who aren't anthropologists or don't want to be an anthropologist. Um, the goal is to teach them how to be, uh, what, what can anthropology do, what can it not do, and how can you be uh, a critical consumer of archaeology and anthropology since you're going to run across it? How can you understand it? And you know, you can, can you tell, is it, is it good archaeology, is it bad archaeology? Um, and then, you know, that's, that's a baseline. And then people who want to learn, um, I try and figure out what, the, what, what aspect do they want to learn? I'll give them an overview. Through the field school, they have to they learn how to dig. They learn how to identify artifacts. Uh, but um, I, want them to, I want them to kind of feed, I want to feed their passion. So, so for instance, I had a student who enjoyed the field work, but she was really passionate about historical research. 
So I, I showed her how the research deeds, I showed her how to, to go to the historical society um, and look through these papers. And she kind of took off with it. So trying to find the, the parts that, that work for them. And so she didn't go, she's not in anthropology. She's not in archeology. span She loosely is interested in history. I think she's environmental science, but that was an avenue she wanted to explore. I feel like it kind of, it's kind of those research skills and some of that historic research she's gonna carry with her. Um, obviously for people who wanna do archeology, span kind of focusing in on what aspect uh, to, for instance, Tammy, uh, Tammy Gillums. Uh, so she was retired. She wants to do archaeology. She doesn't have a degree, but she really enjoys laboratory work. So um, after she finished up, uh, she worked on some of the Edding Street material. And right now she's working on the Northampton material and she's cataloging and curating that material because that's what she enjoys and she wants to learn and practice. And so just trying to figure out what students want to do uh, with this material and giving them those opportunities um, and you know most of the students who come out in the field uh if you remember from marketplace i forget what jordan jordan wallace was i forget her degree but it was nothing and nowhere close to anthropology but i feel like she learned a great deal about history about what she can learn from history and contribute to history and had a fun time in the process you know archaeology should be somewhat enjoyable even though it's 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 heavy labor um how you asked me how did i get in contact with these these different universities, um, I ask. I just uh, I'm I get very persistent. <laughs> um, this is the work we're doing. Would you like to join us? Um, one of, one of the things I wanted to do was contribute financially, so be able to help Alex, be help Jordan, um, and get and provide them with you know the, so that they could actually participate instead of having to work. Uh, and several other students the same way, but just asking. So you know, asking Michael Harwar at JHU. Um, you know, about his students and two of his students came to the Joppa Field School. Um, so asking, uh, asking the, the uh, anthropology department at, at Morgan State if there are any students who want to participate in this project. Um, but it's just trying to actually build a network, build trust, but also build a network of students who want to be involved in this work and faculty members. So we had, uh, I'll just include from uh, uh, um, Coppin State came out his, his colleague actually did some of the oral history work um, that was the, uh, for Upton. Um, so trying to figure out what people want to do and how they can contribute, but also collaborating. It's not, it's not my project, it's many other people's projects and trying to find that intersectionality or those intersections um, and how we can benefit each other. So one of the conversations we had, I had two days ago was with the Reginald Lewis Museum about working with other individuals, collaborating on a, uh, a larger uh, exhibit on working class, uh, African-American working class, and how, how can we put that together and who would like to be involved in that? Thank you. Um, David and Morgan. Um, what are you doing with, with all of the things that you found? Oh, no. <laughs> In, in Maryland and uh, the United States, if you dig in, on someone's property, it's their stuff. So the stuff um, from Upton belongs to Afro Charities, and I'm happy to give that back. Uh, the stuff from Northampton Furnace actually belongs to Baltimore City because they own the watershed. So that material, um, the stuff that we excavated from Edding Street belongs to Black Women Built. Um, so the stuff from the Sellers Mansion, the is gonna to go to the state because it's been deeded to the state. So what we try and do is we preserve this material, we record it, we take pictures of it, and uh, we, we try and understand what it is. And then um, depending on what whoever owns it wants to do, uh, we give it back. If we can, if we think somebody would wanna look at this and study this and look at all this stuff again, we'll, we try and get it to the state because what the state will do is they'll put it in a special room that stays a special temperature and um, they'll take care of it for as long as they can. And if somebody wants to go research it or put it in a display, they'll, they'll let them do that. So that's what we do. But we Thank have to, you. you're welcome. You're welcome. But we have to study it first, which takes a very, very long time. Thank you, Morgan. Um, Mike? Yep. I just wanted to, the, the comment as a historian that I was just fascinated by the the interplay of, of of sort of 
fairly traditional or usual historical research in the archaeology. Uh, I found that quite fascinating uh, and uh, a very valuable demonstration of how the, the two disciplines work together. Yeah, yeah, we have a saying in archaeology that the, the dirt doesn't lie, because people don't normally think about what they throw away. And so usually the, what they throw away is tends to be a, a very unbiased sample. And so we can kind of get a real sense for what people have. And uh, one of the cool things from Edding Street that we're finding, not just some of these medicine bottles, but we also from 1904 and 1906 Edding Street found all of these found German dolls, we found French pipes, we found stuff from all over the globe, Chinese porcelains. So, you know, they're a part of that market. They're a part of, you know, they're finding stuff that they want. And uh, we found, also found, which was really cool, we saw last week, we were looking at the medicine bottles. And so we have some local bottles, but we also have some medicines from the Eastern shore, prescription bottles from the Eastern shore. Does that reflect travel or why are they, why are they where, how are they getting those bottles, which is pretty cool. So we can kind of tease out networks and understand like how, how people are moving. 1904 and 1906, Edding Street, um, seem to go through renters very quickly. So we have lots of working class families that continually cycle through every census. Um, so we have a high turnover rate there, which probably reflects economic instability for the black working class. Mm -hmm. yeah, I find if, if I just through our, our Baltimore History Facebook group and some others, just uh, I've been, you know, I hadn't known about the, just this passionate group of bottle collectors that we have around, some of many of whom are really into history and there's there's also a, a whole subspecialty of uh, patent medicine bottle collectors mm -hmm. yeah so the yeah, i think the passion for the history is wonderful right and uh, uh, one of our, one of the one of those uh, three of those individuals came out and helped us in 1904 1906 heading street which was great uh, one of the problems we have is did you see all the if you remember all this stuff in the hand that's stuff that doesn't get preserved nobody wants people don't want to keep chicken bones and oyster shells and broken pieces most broken pieces of ceramics all of that stuff is really important because we can understand what people are eating how they're eating it where they're getting it from that's really important data to understand someone's life and that's not being collected and so i, I really love this guy these people's passions but going through and excavating things for bottles we're losing a whole bunch of data um, and if we had a very robust laws and we had very robust archaeology in Baltimore, that would be okay. But there's nobody doing a lot of archaeology. There's very little archaeology being done in the city right now. So we're only getting little windows into the history of Baltimore, and we're losing a lot when things get targeted just for models. Um, so hopefully we can we can find a happy medium where it involves uh, more of those collectors. And I think that uh, the people I worked with were great, and they were they would dig, and I would scream like a madman. Uh, because you know they don't normally screen, but I wanted all of that material, and you know, so Noah, one of the things we have to analyze um, next Tuesday is all of these seeds. I have seeds from the bottom of that privy. I know some of the vegetable matter that they were eating, some of the vegetables, fruits that they were eating, which is amazing data to have. Mm -hmm. so. I suppose that sort of points out. I mean, for both historians and 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 anthropologists, the sort of the old saw of you know people find what they're looking for. And, and miss, completely miss what they're not interested in. Like we face that a lot with my, my folklore friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, 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 we're a little greedy. So we try and keep everything. <laughs> we try and take everything back with us if we can. And then we, said, we try and figure out what, what it is. Uh, because, you know, you think about someone's life. You want every aspect of that life to be able to tell that story. And remember, with an archaeology site, it's, you're, you're essentially getting 10% of a puzzle. And that's it. So you're trying to piece together what that image looked like with only 10% of that puzzle. And some of those pieces don't intersect either. So as much data as you can recover, uh, the better. I have a question in the chat from Lydia. Would you consider high school students for projects? Yes, I, I think I would I'd love to have high school students who are motivated and would like to participate. Sure. We've had high school students before. Um, yeah. And Heather? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the tools and devices that you use um, to do your work, because it seems like there's some high-tech stuff and then some really low-tech stuff. I'm just curious <laughs> about that. 
Yeah, so great. That's a great question. So depends on our research goals shape our methods, right? So I do work overseas too for the Department of Defense. Um, and so those are methodologies we use over there are very different because we have different research goals. But um, essentially we try and un understand as much as we can from a site before we even get out there because this work is, it's time consuming. It, it can, it's not that expensive in, in terms of other professions, I guess, but you know, it, it's a lot of work. And uh, so we try and target what we're looking at. So if we have the opportunity to look at LIDAR data, that, that uh, light imaging and de uh, detection and ranging inf information, aerial imagery, historic uh, aerial imagery um, maps. If we can target all of that and figure out what, what exactly was there before, uh, we can focus on it. If we need to look below the earth, uh, we can um, use some more technology, but you know that, that comes at a cost too, that tends to be fairly expensive. Uh, so we can use ground penetrating radar or magnetometry to try and locate features below the surface. At JAPA, we're trying to get um, uh, GPR done again. And that I think the bill for that is about 25,000. Uh, we don't have, I don't have any of that money yet. <laughs> so if anybody has 25,000, that'd be great. Um, but most of, our, most of our tools are fairly simplistic. Um, we, we excavate uh, with shovels and screens uh, and trowels. Uh, we, we excavate, um, squares we did shovel test pits we put it in through a screen um we separate it out we put it in paper bags we bring it to the lab we wash it we catalog it um i think one of the most sophisticated things we have are our reference books all of these books to kind of identify things but it really depends on the nature of our project i mean if we were going to excavate uh, uh some privies in baltimore city that are 20 feet deep you know that would that would entail excavators and shoring up and a lot more technology there but um, we can excavate in Baltimore uh, fairly efficiently with, I would say, low technology tools, um, depending on what we have. Um, you wouldn't want to go into the backyard. You couldn't go in the backyard in Edding Street with a backhoe. It would just wouldn't fit. And plus, and you saw all those utility lines, you wouldn't want to go in there with a backhoe, even though they were all out of service. Um, so, yeah, we have a range of different tools depending on our project. So um, it really depends on what, you, what you're looking for and how do, you, how do you want to get that information? So we try and err on being as simple as possible, uh, just based on our budgets and our, our time. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Fracchia? Speak now, if I have a hold your peace. All right, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been wonderful, super informative. Um, and it's just so great to see how all of these sites are interconnected in Baltimore and outside. Um, just, just, you know, the basic parts of seeing the oyster shells in different backyards and knowing people were having a good time and eating well. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I just wanted to leave everybody with um, a little bit of information. Our next program will be May 19th with Dr. Richard Bell. Um, and his presentation is called Border State, Border War, Fighting for Freedom and Slavery in Antebellum, Maryland. And you can find all of our upcoming events at BaltimoreCityHistoricalSociety.org. Um, so please check that out. Please consider donating to our organization as well. That's All that information is at BaltimoreCityHistoricalSociety.org. So thank you all for coming and thank you, Dr. Frackia, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you so much for listening to me and, and hosting me. And if anybody wants to come out to, to do some work in Joppa in the next couple of weeks, you can send me an email and you, you're welcome to, to come. So great. All right, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.